Matthew 24, let's pray. Father, we come to you, we come, O Christ, to you, true Son of God and man. Lord, we ask you now to speak to our hearts because we're listening in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 24, verse 1, Matthew 24, 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay, now, as we come to chapter 24, which opens with these words that Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and then it says his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple, in order for us to get a really full impact of this verse, we have to reconnect it, as it was in the original, with the verses before it. In other words, no chapter break from chapter 23. And so if we look at it that way, we start at chapter 23, verse 38, which says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. So he spent this day in the temple. He's leaving the temple now. To never return to the temple again. This is it. He's not going to come back. And this temple is going to be destroyed about 30 years later. And his last words that he speaks while he's in the temple are very disturbing. Because these last words are setting the stage for what he's going to tell his disciples all that's, that's that, 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 that that's really on their minds after, after what they've heard him say. They just heard him say one thing. Everybody did. He heard him say one thing, and they're very disturbed by that, which is the chapter 23, verse 38. Chapter 23, verse 38. The last thing that's on their mind is, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Those in the temple will never see him again as the temple, as the glory. He is the glory. He says, we be, he, it says in John 1 that we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Son. And, and, and now the glory of the temple is now leaving the temple. And as he's leaving the temple, he in essence has said in this chapter 23 to the leaders there, you've hijacked my temple. You've made my temple a den of thieves. You formulated a religion which serves yourselves and not God. This is no longer my house. Now it's your house. Now it's a house without God in the temple. This house is now, your house is left unto you desolate. And that's what happens as he leaves. And that's what brings the impact to chapter 24, verse 1, or verse 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. When he left the temple, he left, uh, uh, he left a, in essence, a great world religion, Judaism, 
which has a great heritage, which has a long history, which has an elaborate system that's ever growing of, of traditions, which is typical of, of a world religion. But there was just one problem, and that problem is verse 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. It became a religion without Christ. It was a religion without God. It was a religion of, verse uh, 38, chapter 23, verse 38, it was a religion of, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And that's what religion is without Christ, desolate. Lots of works, but desolate. Lots of traditions, but desolate. Lots of heritage, but desolate because it's without Christ. It's as desolate as Jehovah Jesus said in Hosea 9.12, Hosea 9.12, Woe also to them when I depart from them. From a, 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 as desolate as Jeremiah 6.8, Jeremiah 6.8, Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate. And they didn't know this. They wouldn't know this. And he had talked about how they didn't know this. He said, he, he, he said, your eyes can't see. Your ears can't hear. He says, but because they didn't know that when Christ departed from them, not only their glory left them, but their defense left them. And they were left defenseless against their enemies who in, a th in three decades later, short 30 years, some odd years later, when the enemies came in, they were defenseless against Titus. Now, Christ did not depart the temple until he was driven out, essentially, of the temple. The temple was his house, Christ as God. Christ took a great interest in the temple. This was his house when he was just a boy of of 12 years old at the Passover, he spent, he, he doubled back and spent hours in his temple listening uh, uh, to the rabbis and questioning them. Twice when he came to his house, his temple, he threw out those who were selling animals for sacrifices. He, it says in a place there, he didn't even let anybody carry a container through the, through the temple in, in, in Mark eleven sixteen Mark eleven sixteen He would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. Why? It was his house. It was his temple. He insisted that his house should be called a house of prayer. A house of prayer. And whenever Christ was in Jerusalem, he made a beeline to the temple. That's where you found him, in the temple. Sometimes he spoke, he was teaching in the temple. Other times he was silent, just looking around and observing in the temple. As he watched, for example, people casting their, off, casting their money, putting their money into the treasury. That's when he saw this widow casting in her money in the temple in Mark 12, 1241. Mark 1241, 1241. Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing, and he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto him, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow, widow hath cast more in than all they which cast in the treasury, for all they did cast in their abundance, but she of her want cast in all that she had. He sat there and watched and took it all in. And that's when he saw this widow casting in the small amount. And it became a subject for his teaching. He loved the temple. And that's what, what made it such a sad day. Such a sad day. In, 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 in verse 1 here, when he left the temple. It's interesting in verse 1. It says... It, it, it's a double statement in verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. He didn't just walk out. He departed. 
And now in chapter 24 that he's departed from the temple, he now speaks about the destruction of the temple. And he left the temple. He left Judaism. He didn't leave his disciples. And that's the point. He didn't leave his disciples. In verse 1, he left the temple, but his disciples came into him. We just were singing a wonderful hymn about at the cross what happened. Well, one of the verses we were just singing was, there at the cross where he took me in. There at the temple when he left the temple, but there outside the temple he took in the disciples. And these were the disciples who were also forced out of the temple, as it says in John 9.22. John 9.22. The Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. He should be put out of the synagogue. Yeah, um, kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, uh, in a few days. And this Wednesday, uh, I, I have an appointment at the Israeli consulate in San Francisco for an interview, for an interview for my uh, for my application to become, to get an, an investor visa in Israel. Israel and the U.S. are the only two countries in the world that have an investor visa agreement whereby Americans who invest in Israel can get an investor in visa and Israelis who invest in America can get an investor visa. It means they can come and go like they were citizens. Anyway, so this, um, so this, this meeting, uh, uh, this uh, interview that I'm going to have on Wednesday, they sent me a two-page form and they said, fill this out before your meeting so we know about you, what's your, well, what's your mother's name, what's your father's name, and, you know, and all these kind of questions. And one of the questions on there is religion. What is your religion? Um, and, uh, <clears throat> I mean, that's a pretty good question for someone applying for an investor visa, don't you think? <laughs> anyway, what's your religion? So this bothers me a lot. What's your religion? So I go back to the Israeli, uh, the, the state of Israel's definition of religion. You are Jewish if your mother was Jewish. So I said, okay, I'm Jewish. My mother was Jewish. My father was Jewish as well. So there you go, a double whammy, mother and father. So you're Jewish, okay. But you're not Jewish if, 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 you, if you convert, so to speak, to another religion. I said, well, well what, is it, what is the act and, and what is the belief that negates your the birth by your mother? And they go, birth by your mother. So the question is, anyways, is this not a, a violation of the freedom of religion? Anyways, it doesn't matter. But the point is that the, in, in, in John 9, 29, the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Okay, I don't want to go there right now. So anyway, the disciples were Jews who, who only left the temple when they were forced to leave the temple because they confessed Christ. And now they're outside the temple and they go and find Christ, who's also departed from the temple. Uh, that, that, that's why people ask me sometimes, are you messianic? And I tell them, look, when the synagogue told me that I could not remain in the synagogue, and say the name of Jesus Christ, then I left the synagogue and I have no interest in going back to any practices of the synagogue. Okay, so the Lord now is on his way back to Bethany. He's left the temple and the disciples stop him as he's leaving Jerusalem. The disciples are coming to show him the buildings of the temple. They're very impressed with the buildings of the temple and they're magnificent. These buildings were were, were not the original buildings, as we know, that Solomon had built. Those were destroyed by the Babylonians. And these were not even the buildings that were rebuilt uh, at that time, it were not the same, when the Jews re returned to rebuild the temple, because the Jews who returned to rebuild the temple after 70 years of Babylonian captivity, and they were allowed to return by the king of Persia, they, th there were some of those Jews who returned were old. They were called ancient men in the Bible, and, and they remembered the first temple that was built, and, they and when the foundation for this second temple was laid, 
the, 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 it says in Haggai 2.3, Haggai 2.3, God said, Who is left among you that saw the house, this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison, God said, of it as nothing? Nothing? Ezra 3.12, Ezra 3.12 says, Many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men, that's the way I feel a little bit. I'm an ancient man. I remember my neighbor one time said, said you know, uh, if somebody asked him in Spanish, how are you? And he said, ancien. He <laughs> says ancient. Anyway, never mind. The, these were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice. That was, that, 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 they cried because they saw, this is nothing compared to the first temple. I remember it. It was 70 years later, later 70 years. I don't know, those men must have been 80, 90, 100 years. I don't know how old they were. They were ancient men. They, they cried. They cried like a baby. And God said to them, okay, who of you has left that saw the first one? He said, what do you think? It's like nothing, right? That's when God told Israel in Zechariah 4.10, Zechariah 4.10, who hath despised the day of small things? God says, don't despise that, because the second temple, well, well, it started off very sl small, but it grew, and it became large, and it became magnificent, and Herod added to it as well, just as God told Israel. Job about his suffering, about his suffering in Job 8 7. Job 8 7, he said, Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end shall greatly increase. And that's the point is that this temple had become more and more beautiful, more and more magnificent. And when the disciples came to Christ, we can just feel the pride that was welling up in them as they looked at this temple and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and, and all the more shock when, when Christ made his, his, his prediction. Actually, the reason why Christ talked about the stones in, in this passage in Matthew is because that's specifically what the disciples were pointing to, were asking the Lord to look at. In Mark 13, 1, we get that, Mark 13, 1. As he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones... And what buildings are here? And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another, shall not be thrown down. Now, we're not told which disciple came to him and pointed out these stones. Probably Peter. Peter was always the one who was out front. But we can feel the excitement over the stones. He says, look at these stones. They're incredible. The stones were very impressive. As a matter of fact, the historian Josephus tells us about the stones of the foundation of the temple. He says they were 70 feet long and 10 feet tall and 8 feet deep. Clint, can you imagine a stone 70 feet long, 10, taller than a person? And, 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 and deeper than a person lying down. That's incredible. And it says, uh, Josephus tells us that they were marble of green and white marble, beautiful when the sun hit them and reflected off and that they had beautiful paintings in them. And he went on to say that the pillars in the temple were as thick as three people standing. That was the thickness of the pillars. And even Titus has said that when he came to the temple, he was astonished when he came to destroy the temple, he was astonished and he carried parts of it back to Rome. And if you go to Rome, you can see some, some carvings of, of Titus carrying back some of the things, probably now in the Vatican. We don't want to say anything about that. But anyway, so when the disciples were so excited to look at those stones, they expected for Christ to be just as impressed as they were, especially because these disciples and Christ, for that matter, lived in, 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 in Galilee, and they didn't get to see these stones that often. So the, when, the, when, the, when the disciples came and they said, look at these great stones, and, 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 and they were hoping maybe the Lord's going to reverse his statement about this house being left desolate. And they're looking at all these precious stones. They're ready to, 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 to cry out, but... but uh, but uh, over the stones, but, 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 but Christ 
was not crying out over the stones. Actually, he was crying out. He was crying out in Luke 19.41. Luke 19.41, it says when, when Christ, when he was come near and he beheld the city, he wept over it. He wept over it. He, 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 it wasn't the stones and the walls that, that he was weeping over. It was the lost souls in Jerusalem that caused him to break down and cry. And this was a case where the disciples' thoughts were over the loss of the stones and the walls and the beauty. And they were not over the same thoughts of Christ crying over loss of souls. As it says in Isaiah 55, 8, so Isaiah 55, 8, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Higher not stones and walls, but souls. And he's asking the, the disciples, have the same thoughts. Have the higher thoughts that I have. Get on the same page with me. Now the Lord does, not, does look at those stones, and he does look at those buildings, and he turns to his disciples, and he says, I want you to look carefully at them also. In, in verse 2, verse 2, Jesus said unto them, See ye not? All these things, verily I say unto you, that there shall not be left here one stone upon another which shall not be thrown down. So when he says this in verse 2, see not all these things, he's asking them to look carefully at the beauty of the stones. Look carefully at the beauty of the buildings and see beyond, see beyond the present to what's going to happen. See the certain ruin that's going to come to these stones. We're so prone to look at the present to think it's just going to continue as it has been. But beautiful buildings will become a, a, a pile of rubble. And, and beautiful strong bodies will be eaten by worms. And so seeing beyond the present is what Christ is asking his disciples to do in, in verse 2. Just like Peter in, in, in 2 Peter 3.10, 2 Peter 3.10, when he speaks about the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are seen shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found in him in peace, without spot and blameless. You know, as you scan the bodies in Takati, as you go down the the front uh, little path, uh, uh, walkway to the front there. There's, 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 uh, there's, uh, there's, there's one thing on, on, the, on one side of the path and nothing on the other side of the path and then a, a label for the path. The path says, uh, it says uh, path of grace, path of grace. And on one side are, are, are fossils from the flood. And on the other side are stainless steel flames. Not really flames, but they're stainless steel. Stainless steel flames. And the, and the message of that symbolism is we in our world walk down a limited, by time, path of grace because we are sandwiched between two great destructions. The destruction by water in the flood, so that's why they have the fossils there, and the destru destruction of fire that Peter is talking about. And we're on this path of grace. And so when, when Christ is saying, look at all these buildings, look at all these stone, uh, the, those walls, he's saying, temporary, temporary. It's a grace right now. That's why Peter, the two, the two words that are most important in this Peter, sec, in this 2 Peter 3 passage, 10, 10 through 14, is the two words, seeing and looking. Seeing and looking. Seeing all these things will be dissolved looking for the coming of Christ. So Christ says in verse 2, see ye not all these things? He's directing their eyes 
as Peter is in 2 Peter 3.11, 2 Peter 3.11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. And to see them all dissolved, to see them all disappearing, there's going to be great, great, great heat, is to look for the, the, the new heavens and the new earth. This is, this is Abraham. This is the life of Abraham. This explains the life of Abraham. This tells why this very wealthy man never built himself a mansion, which he had the money and the resources to do. But instead, if Abraham had a coat on, on his lapel would be a tent. We should all wear tents. A tent, because he was making a life statement by his tent that uh, his life statement was Hebrews 11.10. Hebrews 11.10. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Especially after he saw the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, whose builder and maker was man, homosexual man. Abraham did not want to call a place that was going to be burned up, as Sodom and Gomorrah was, that was going to be burned up. He didn't want to call that place home, so he kept looking and looking for a city. And therefore, the, 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 the challenge that comes to us from the life of Abraham is Hebrews 3, 13, 14. Hebrews 13, 14. Here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We don't have a continuing city here. And this is what Christ is saying about these stones and buildings in Jerusalem. He's saying to them, boys, you don't have a continuing temple here. It's going to be destroyed. And like Abraham, he's directing their eyes. Look for the place that I promised to you in John 14.1. John 14.1, when I told you, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He said, I've gone to make a permanent city whose builder and maker is me, Christ said, God, in other words. He says, that's the one that you should be looking forward to, not this one down here with all the magnificence of the stones and everything. So with the disciples looking at the buildings, and the Lord makes this shocking prediction to them, that not one stone would be left uh, 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 upon another. And by the way, when, when Titus did come in to destroy Jerusalem, he gave specific orders to his officers to not let one stone be left upon another. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. I've been to Israel. I've gone to the Kotel. I've gone to the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. And I see one stone that's left upon another. That was not part of the temple. That was the foundation for the wall, the foundation. So today, what excites those who come to the place where the temple was were the, storms, the, the stones that formed the substructures of the walls. That's what the Wailing Wall is. Now, the Lord now is outside the city of Jerusalem. He's decided to sit down on the Mount of Olives, it says in verse 3, verse 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. The Mount of Olives provides really the best view of the city because it kind of rises up and it says mountain, hill, whatever you want to call it, in front of the city. For strategic reasons, this was the place that Titus used as a staging site when he mounted his, his siege against Jerusalem and eventually the destruction of Jerusalem was the Mount of Olives. So Christ now, on this Mount of Olives, he sees all this. He sees Titus. He sees the destroying army assembling that's going to destroy Jerusalem. He sees this, and he makes this prediction. He tells one, not one stone will be left upon another. He hears Titus on the Mount of Olives give this command to his generals, do not let one stone be left upon another. But he's sitting there at this time on the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side, of the city of Jerusalem. The east side means that in the morning, the sun rises from the side of the Mount of Olives and it pours its light 
over those marble columns and walls and stone and, 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 the, and reflects the beauty of that green and white and we can only imagine. The gold, lots of gold. Remember the, 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 the Lord had accused the, the, the scribes and Pharisees for saying, oh, you're swearing by the gold and that's more important than the altar and so forth. So, but, it, but it, it's a beauty, beauty of the, uh, 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 as the light rose from the Mount of Olives. And then if you were sitting on the Mount of Olives, as the sun goes down opposite the other side, the west side there, then the sunlight pr provides this beautiful golden frame for the temple as the sun is setting there with its 24 foot high walls uh, of, of Jerusalem. And then you can imagine the dark shadows at sunset being cast in the direction of the Mount of Olives where he is. Now, <clears throat> Any mention at that time, any mention that this magnificent temple, this wonderful city of Jerusalem, was going to be destroyed was enough to start a protest, a riot. As a matter of fact, when the crowd was getting all foamed up and, and worked up to the point where, uh, of murdering Stephen, murdering Stephen, what really worked them up was their false accusation that, oh, Jesus said he was going to destroy this temple in Acts 6.13, Acts 6.13. They set up false witnesses which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered to us. So, this is a very, very disturbing statement, so the, but the disciples want to know. They want to know from Christ more information about this coming destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. But they must not ask him openly, publicly, about this. They have to be very quiet about this. This has to be asked privately, because no one can hear Christ answer and that's why we read in verse 3, in verse 3, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? It was private. Now, we know that it wasn't all the disciples who, who came to Christ and asked him about more details about the destruction. As a matter of fact, we know there were just four disciples that came to him on the QT, silently, in Mark 13, 3, Mark 13, 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? It's interesting that the disciples when they heard him say that the, it was going to be destroyed, they didn't just dismiss it but about the destruction of the temple and the Jerusalem. They didn't say, that's impossible. Look at these walls, they're impenetrable. But the disciples believed Christ. They believed him. And they want, just wanted to know more. They wanted to know more privately without any of the Jews seeing them ask him for more details it was a private thing. They wanted to know just between him and, and them and Christ. Tell us. It reminds me of two Jewish persons this last week. One was a, a, is an Orthodox Jewish man in New York who called um, Israel Restoration Ministries and said to, said to the person who answered the phone that he secretly believes in Jesus. And he said that he, he wants more information about Jesus Christ but he doesn't want any printed material that others could see him reading. He only wanted digital material that he can secretly read on his phone. So we directed him to over 300 hours of the YouTube videos and this class in Genesis and over 10,000 pages of note that we've organized online. Because like the disciples who asked the Lord privately, this Jewish Orthodox man is privately inquiring about, from, uh, about Jesus Christ. And then yesterday, 
I, my Lyft driver was a Somali, a Somali. And, uh, and, and surprising to me is that he told me, the Somali Muslim man, he, he told me that, that he loved the Jewish people. I thought, what? Be, because he said his wife's oncologist was an Israeli doctor and they have become really good friends and he calls them and you know his wife passed away but he calls them and the Somali man has even traveled with his Israeli doctor friend to Israel three times so I said wow you know and as we talked about his Israeli doctor friend he said well he told me he believes in Jesus and I said what I said wait a minute are you telling me that this Jewish Israeli doctor believes in Jesus and then the, the, the Somali man said, oh, 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 I, I wasn't supposed to tell you that. I wasn't supposed to tell anyone. He told me to keep it a secret because of what would happen to him in Israel if it became known that he believes in Jesus. I said, yeah, he may be no longer a Jew. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. This. So like the disciples who came to Christ privately to ask him about the coming destruction, there, 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 there are those, there were those John 12, 42, John 12, 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him that they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So the disciples now are coming to Christ, and they've got two specific questions. They want to know when this great destruction is going to occur. Now, they already know that this great destruction is going to happen in their lifetime because Christ said in, in the previous chapter, in chapter 23, verse 34, chapter 23, verse 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may uh, become all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel and all, uh, verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. And then he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children as a hen, gathered her children's under her, uh, chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. They knew that the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem was going to happen in their generation, in their lifetime. They just wanted to know exactly when. They wanted to have, you know, and the second question is, what's the sign? What's the sign that we're looking for that this is imminent, that this is going to happen? Christ was telling them that, 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 uh, that, that there was going to be an immediate fulfillment, but in what he said, it was in what he said that indicated like there's an immediate fulfillment, but there's also another fulfillment later than that, a future fulfillment. The immediate fulfillment was in 70 AD when Titus came and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. That was the, when it, what happened about 30 years later. But what Christ has done here in his prophetic prediction is so common in the scripture to use an immediate event to serve as a prophecy for a eventual future event this is common in scripture where prophecy seems to have been fulfilled by something that happened then but not exactly because the wording of the prophecy leads you to believe that it's not totally fulfilled for example, the prophecy in Isaiah 7.14, Isaiah 7.14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. She shall call his name Emmanuel. The Hebrew word translated for virgin is the word Alma, which does not mean 100% of the time virgin. In the, in the five times it is used in Scripture, four out of five times it's referring to a virgin, but there is a time, a fifth time, where that, is, that one time Alma does not mean a virgin. And there was an immediate fulfillment to, to that prophecy in the next chapter, in Isaiah 8, verse 3, Isaiah 8, verse 3, where Isaiah says, I went unto the prophetess, she conceived and bare a son, and said the Lord unto me, call his name in the very... Mahar Shalabash, something like that. Now, that was an immediate fulfillment. 
but there were just parts of that prophecy which, which, which left you hanging and left you thinking it's not totally fulfilled because, because that son wasn't called Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Uh, behold, an Alma shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The name of Isaiah's son was not Emmanuel. So there was both an immediate fulfillment and a future fulfillment of that prophecy. The future fulfillment uh, 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 of that was was, was Matthew 121, Matthew 121. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin uh, shall be with the child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God, God with us. That's, that's the, 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 the parthogenesis word in, uh, from Greek, means uh, uh, a virgin, a virgin. Mm. And by the way, when the Septuagint was translated from Hebrew into Greek hundreds of years before Christ by 70 rabbis carrying the current Jewish thought among the Jewish people, they used the word parthogenesis also. But anyway, the point is this double fulfillment with the immediate and future is what's happening here with Christ's prediction as what will happen. Now the disciples, they don't understand that there's two fulfillments here, that, that what Christ is, 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 is saying. Because they think it's just all one, which is when they replied in verse 3, verse 3, tell us when shall these things be, what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world. This is not the end of the world in, 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 in 70 AD. They misunderstood in thinking that when Jerusalem and, and the temple would be destroyed, that that's also going to be the same time as the coming of Christ and of the end of the world, which means it's real easy to see what prophecy is referring to after it happens. And you can look back and say, oh, that, that's what that prophecy is referring to, which is why I, 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 I stay away from, I won't, I do not want to teach anything on prophecy. Because I'd rather wait till it happens and then tell you what it, what it meant. A pastor came to me recently and said, are you, are you a, a pre-trib rapture or a mid-trip rapture or a post-trib rapture? And I told him, I want to be right. So I'll tell you exactly if the rapture is, is before the tribulation or in the middle of the tribulation or after the tribulation. And I'll be 100% right because I'll tell you after the rapture happens, after it comes. Right now... I'm too busy worrying about the present than to worry about the exact details of the future. And I really haven't given it much thought as to about when the rapture happens. And frankly, it's not a hill I'm willing to die on. So right now, I'm just taking a position on that. I'm not taking a position on that. And in this chapter, there are things that Christ will say that, frankly, I leave as a mystery. I don't know. I'm not sure. Because there's a danger, and there has been a danger with, with, uh, with Scripture, of people over-refining what, uh, and, and, and what, what's going to happen when, and it damages the understanding of a chapter like this. Over-refinement is when a person confines his position to a particular interpretation and doesn't allow room for, I don't know, he doesn't allow room for vamos a ver, he doesn't allow room, let's wait and see. He doesn't allow room. So the first question that the disciples ask is when, in verse 3. Tell us, when shall these things be? They want to know the time when these destructions are going to happen. They want to be told, like Daniel was told about this is the time, and Daniel 9.24, Daniel 9.24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation, to bring in everlasting righteousness, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, the wall. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the Prince shall come to destroy the city, etc. So, the disciples, they want something like this. Tell us how many weeks, how many years, exactly from what point we're counting. And as the disciples are laser focused, waiting, listening for Christ to answer their question, when, that what they heard him say 
in verse 4 is Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now, when they got that for an answer, we can see them looking at each other and puzzled with, Did he not hear our question? Why is he not giving us an answer to our question? We asked him when the great destruction is going to happen, and he answers us with a, a disconnect warning to not be deceived. They thought he didn't answer their question. But the truth is, he did answer their question. Because it says in verse 4, and Jesus answered. So he wasn't off on some other tangent or, or talking uh, 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 away. The answer to their question of what Christ is going to return in the end of the world is deception. That's the answer to their question. There's going to be strong deception that's going to threaten to overwhelm believers. Now, what's deception? What's deception? Well, the first deception, the classic uh, illustration of deception, is the first deception in the Bible, which, which we are told in 1 Timothy 2.14, 1 Timothy 2.14, Timothy 2, 14, says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Eve was deceived by Satan in the Garden of Eden. And this picture is in Genesis 3.2. Genesis 3.2. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, that your eyes should be open, and you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband. God had clearly stated that if Eve ate from the, the, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that she would die. And that made the fruit from the... The, the tree, something to be not looked at nor thought about. It was dangerous. The deception was that Eve concluded that God was wrong and she was right. God said that the tree was bad for food because it was poison in the sense that it would bring death. But Eve did not agree with God. Eve felt that the tree was good for food. Genesis 3, 6, Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, Eve saw the tree as it's going to taste good, it's going to make me feel good after I eat it, feel, feel, feel. That's the, t John, that's the 1 John 2, 16, 1 John 2, 16, the lust of the flesh. God said, you should look at the tree, the fruit of the tree, as ugly and as bad because it's going to bring death. But Eve did not agree with God. Eve felt the tree was a beautiful sight. Genesis 3, 6, Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the tree was pleasant to the eyes, Eve saw the tree as beautiful and enjoyable to look at. That's what 1 John 2, 16 calls the lust of the eyes. God said that the tree would destroy her into a state of death. But Eve didn't agree with God. Eve felt that the tree would do the opposite, build her up to a state of being wise and having more knowledge. Genesis 3, 6, Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. So Eve saw the tree as able to make, tree, make Eve great with wisdom and knowledge. That's what 1 John 2, 16, 1 John 2, 16 calls the pride of life. And that's the picture of deception. And in those three areas, it was God said, but Eve felt. God said, but Eve felt. God said, but Eve felt. God said the tree was fatally bad for food, but Eve felt the tree was good for food. God said the tree was ugly as death to the eyes, but Eve felt the tree was pleasant to the eyes. God said the tree would make a person dead, but Eve felt 
the tree would make a person wise. It was all God said, but Eve felt. For Eve, it was all, I don't care what God said, I feel. I don't care what God said, I believe. Eve put her feelings of her personal beliefs against what God said, and Eve said, my feelings and my beliefs win over what God said. And that's what deception is. Deception is following personal feelings and personal beliefs over what God said in his word. And the basis for deception, for Eve's deception, for our deception, is the heart, the heart. The human heart, God says, within the soul is the traitor within the soul. It is the, it, 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 Gen, Jeremiah 17, 9, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. So when God says the heart is deceitful over anything else and desperately wicked, God is saying there's no such thing as a good heart. There's no such thing as a good heart. How can a heart that is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked be evil? That's why Christ said, if you, from, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more should your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? We all have a terrible handicap, and it's our heart. We all have a terrible disability, and it's our treacherous, wicked, deceptive heart. And the path to deception is lined with advice. Just follow your heart. Follow your heart. Our heart is the Judas Iscariot inside of us betraying us into a path of destruction. And we may not even be aware of it. We may not even be aware of it. There's such a battle going on inside of us. It's the conflict between our hearts and the Word of God. And we determine who's going to win. We determine to determine. We determine who will win the battle by which one we listen to more, our hearts or the Bible. That's why it's so important to keep ourselves saturated in the book, keep, keep, the, keep ourselves immersed in the Bible. Just like the man, the, the story of the man who had two dogs on leashes and they were ready to tear each other apart. The two dogs were fighting, were ready to tear each other apart, and they were growling at each other. And another man came up to the, that man and said, which dog wins when they fight? And the man says, the one I say sick him to. <laughs> and when we stop reading the Bible and start le le listening to our hearts, we're saying to our deceptive hearts, sick him against the Bible. But when we keep ourselves in the Bible, we say to the Bible, sick him against our deceptive hearts. An illustration of the value of the Bible, keep our deceptive hearts under control, is a picture of, you may have heard this, of the three mountain climbers who are on the ridge climbing up the mountain. And they're all tied to each other. They're tethered to each other. The mountain climber leading the group, his name is Fact. The second mountain climber after him, his name is Faith. And the one behind his name is Feeling. And all of a sudden, the last climber, Feeling, falls. But the two climbers, Faith and Fact, dig in. And they're able to pull Feeling back up, get him back up on the ridge again. And then all of a sudden, both feeling and faith, they both fall. But fact digs in more deeper and, and, and strong enough, he pulls them both back up on the ridge. Fact is the Bible. And by staying immersed in the Bible, we're able to recover after our feelings and even our faith have failed. Psalm 119, 176. Psalm 119, 76. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. 2 Timothy 2.13, 2 Timothy 2.13. For if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. As the hymn says, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. The rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. The rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds, grips the solid rock. And the reason that the deception becomes so strong is because of what's going to happen in the last days. 
In the last days, 2 Timothy 3.1, 2 Timothy 3.1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. What's that mean? When the lovers know? That means that as we get closer and closer to the coming of Christ, 2 Timothy 3.4, 2 Timothy 3.4, it will be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Instead of 2 Corinthians 5.15, 2 Corinthians 5.15, they which should live not unto them, henceforth unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. That means the time goes closer and closer, the Bible will be read less, and following the heart will be more and more. Now, Christ said that there's going to be many who would come in verse 5. Verse 5, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. That doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to come and claim to be Jesus of Nazareth. But it means that people are going to come and assume the place of Christ. The Greek uh, in, in, uh, in um, verse 5, in my, that's translated in my name, literally means on my name, on my name, which means on the ground of my name. In other words, people are going to come as though they were sent by Christ with a special message from Christ. Deceivers, like Joseph Smith, who started Mormonism and came Claim, came, came claiming that, that, that he was sent by Christ and received another testament, the Book of, of Mormon, and millions followed him. But it could be that those who claim to be Christ, for example, Bar Kokhba, and even uh, uh, claimed to be the Messiah, and even Menachem Shearson, who started the Chabad movement, many believe that he's the Messiah as well. So this is where Christ is coming from. He's saying to them, you want to know the time? It's going to be all about deception. Watch the deception, and you will see, and you will know that the time is at hand. And be careful. Stay in the Bible. Stay in the Word to keep from being deceived. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for our Lord Jesus Christ, our great shepherd, our great leader, our great Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.